We have this book called the Bible, and part of it's the New Testament. The first four books we call in the New Testament are the, the story about Jesus and his ministry on the earth. And there's a lot of, I have a Bible that has the red letter edition. So whenever you see red letters, it's the words of Jesus. Now, isn't it interesting, once you get past Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and get into Acts and uh, Romans and all the way through to Revelation, you find very little red letters. In other words, those who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write, they didn't copy or they didn't put forward more of Jesus' words. But there are a few occasions where the writers of the New Testament said Jesus' words. And, one of, and just a few times, but here is one of the most famous times that Jesus is quoted in the book of Acts, which was written by the physician Luke. And it says that, Remember that our Lord Jesus said, more blessings come from giving than from receiving. It's more blessed to give than to receive. How many think that's true? Great. I want to ask you to come talk to me right after service because I want you to give everything that you have to me because I want you to be blessed. We're going to begin, this is going to kind of be our core verse, I think, but I'm beginning a new series today, and I'm going to call it I Like Giving. About a month ago, I received a letter from, it was a form letter, but it had my name personally, from a pastor in Washington, D.C. He started a church uh, some 20 years ago. Some of you know him. He's written books. His name is Mark Batterson, and Mark Batterson is an Assemblies of God pastor, started uh, National Cathedral Church, and uh, they have a wonderful wonderful church there, but he sent me personally, along with whoever, however many uh, other pastors he wrote to a cover letter, and he sent this book. It's called I Like Giving, and uh, written by a gentleman by the name of Brad Formsma. And I want to encourage you, when you get a chance, you could even do it now. I saw some people using their cell phones earlier. You could even check it out while I'm talking. Don't do that. ILikeGiving.com. Because when you find ilikegiving.com, you're going to find all sorts of stories about people giving and how they served others and they gave to others. There's some video stories there. We should do some of those, Manny. And there's some just written stories. But ilikegiving.com. Everybody say, I like giving. Uh, and say, I like receiving more than I like giving. No, don't do that. How many here realize or believe that you will live forever? How many believe you'll live forever? Now, I haven't, I've been at the, the bedside of many people in my life that were dying, uh, and uh, I always had the impression that they had that idea and that sense that this wasn't the end. No matter what their state of mind was or where they were, they didn't feel like this is it, not one of them, because they had this inner wiring that says, you know, life is not just what we see here. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, it says, God has planted eternity in the human heart. God's placed that in every one of us. If we haven't extinguished it, yet we experience that God has put it, we believe. And how many know that throughout history, we've always looked for the fountain of youth because we want to live forever, ever. In fact, how many are familiar with a store called Forever 21? I'm going, what? Forever 21? And uh, I won't tell you who goes into that store. But at any rate, uh, we saw one of those stores on vacation, and then uh, one of our family members went into that store, Forever 21, and they're not 21. Not, not even close. But... Uh, uh, but it, doesn't that just speak to the fact that though we see it, we go, man, we want to live forever. Now, how many here want to live forever? How many aren't sure? I see those hands. So God put it in our hearts that we will live forever. In fact, when we put our trust in God, here's a neat verse that says, what's going to happen to us is that one day our heart will stop beating. And I can reflect just standing at the bedside of, and I even think of my own mom, and uh, standing there when her heart stopped beating. Her body, that was the end of her body as I knew it, but it wasn't the end of her. And here's what the scripture says. When this tent, which talks about our earthly body, we live in, our body here on earth, is torn down. 
How many feel like your body's getting torn down? God, when it's finally torn down, God will have a house in heaven for us to live in, a home he himself has made which will last forever. So here's the sermon in a sentence. Write this down. If you get nothing else, if we get nowhere else, if the clock runs out on me, you got this part. Live like you were made to last forever because you are. So if that were be the core idea of what you would hang on to today, live like you were made to last forever because you are. Now, do you know one of the greatest problems that we have in our culture? What would it be? You write it down right next to that. It's called short-term thinking. It is the greatest problem with us because we're saying it's here and now. Grab for all the gusto you can. Oh, that's an old commercial like back in my generation. Anyway, you grab for all you can get in the moment. It's all about the moment without regard to what's coming down the road in the future and living our life today in light of the fact that we're going to live forever. That we're going to live forever. So I want to just encourage you, what do we do with the life we have to live in light of, what are we going to do with our lives in light of the fact that we're going to live forever? We're going to live forever. In fact, in the scriptures, I think it's on your outline, um, it's amazing what the Bible has to say about what our life on this earth is like. In fact, James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, said, what is your life? What is your life? And in the New Living Translation, it says, your life is like a Watsonville morning fog. It's here a little while when you come in on Sunday morning sometimes, and then it's gone when you get out the door. It says that's what your life on this earth is like. You're just here for a moment. So, how are we going to live our life in light of the fact that we will live forever and how we want to say, I want to live life to the fullest. So here we go. Let me see if I can just lay a foundation for this The earlier, uh, as I've been doing for several months, series, emphasis, ministry, messages about holding people up, how we can be encouraged in in our down times, now I want to begin a series on how to build us up. How do we build ourselves up in our faith? So, first of all, if I'm going to live my life though I live as though I'm going to live forever, the first thing I would say is ask yourself, what am I living for? Ask myself, what am I living for? How do you see your life? What do you see yourself living for? What are you doing with your life? What am I living for? Here's some questions that will help you. If you want to know what you're living for, this is the first question. What do you think about more than anything else? What is it that you think about more than anything else? Here's another question. If you want to know what you're living for, what do you spend your money on? Where do you put your emphasis with your money? Another one, how do you know what you're living for? How do you spend your time? How do you spend your time? Here's another one. uh, If you're living... Now, this is a tough one. Uh, I was with my uh, brother-in-law's wife this weekend, and uh, she was teasing me a little bit, but how, how do we know how we're living our life? How do we treat other people? And so she was kind of teasing with me about... Uh, of course, I need to be, because I'm a pastor, I need to forgive people, and I say, well, most of them I do, but some of them I don't. But if you're going to test on how you're living your life, how do you treat other people? And last question I'd ask is, where is your heart? Where is your heart? So I ask myself, what am I living for? In Romans 12, 2, it says this, Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world. But let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of mind. Now, how many still need a little help on the change of mind part? Just turn to the person next to you and say, you still have some work to do. (laughs) And then you can say back to them, more than you know. More than you know. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God. How many love advertisements? 
Do you know that every advertisement basically has three things behind it, or all three? It, the, the message is, you need this in order to be happy, or you need to feel this way in order to be happy, or you need to uh, be recognized in order to be happy. In other words, you need to have possessions. If you don't have this car, then you don't even get the girl. Have, have you noticed those commercials? Or use this toothpaste and you get the girl. You know, it's weird stuff. So what do I have and how do I feel and who's recognizing me? You want to be somebody. Advertising goes after uh, how do you feel and what do you have and you are somebody. And if you'll only get this, you'll be somebody. But the real idea is if we're going to say what am I living for is to say I'm living for the glory of God. I am living to bring honor to God. And if I live my life in such a way to honor him, then he takes care of all the rest. Now, how many believe that on a Sunday morning sitting here in the chairs? <laughs> That's nobody. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> it's usually that way on Monday mornings, but not Sunday mornings. We believe that if we put our trust in God, we live our lives for him and for his glory, he will take care of the rest. That's what Jesus said, and that's the assurance we have. Right? So, what do you live in your life for? Young people, what do you live in your life for? If you can grasp earlier in your life than some of us that are older, that you live your life for the glory of God, we will guarantee you, you will be much more fulfilled. You will even be happier in life going forward. If you can just get that locked down and work on it and weave it into your life, that you live to honor God and you live to bring glory to God and you want to live for his purposes. And if you do that, then he'll take care of all the rest. Do you believe that to be true? But we live in this day and in this culture, and man, everything around us fights against that very issue, that very concern. In fact, everything around you teaches you to grab for all you can get and to hang on because you may not have much if you don't hang on to it because nobody else is going to do it for you. So, I think it's a blank on your outline, but uh, ask yourself, what are you living for? And here's the issue. Life on earth is a test. This is a test. If this had been an actual emergency, you would have been instructed. Anyway, uh, this is a test. Your life on this earth is a test. And the greatest test you have is what will you do with God and Jesus? How are you going to live your life? The greatest test. Everything around you and every step you take, God's watching. He notices, not out of guilt, not out of condemnation. He even sees when you pass the test because you go and open the door for somebody else and let them in. Or if you pick up that piece of trash and nobody saw it, does, do you think God saw you pass that test? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it reveals where we are living our lives and how life is a test. And so, turn to the person next to you and say, life is a test. It is not an actual emergency. Life is a test. Now, I didn't put this on your notes, and I've been gone a week, so I'm a little ad-libbing because I'm kind of full. So then it gets messy, Jeff. Did you know that there is a king in the Old Testament? His name is Hezekiah, and Scott Hubbard, no, there is not a book called Hezekiah. There is a king. And so some people sometimes stand up and say, would you turn to Hezekiah? And people go, okay, I can't find Hezekiah, because there's no book, Hezekiah. Hezekiah is a king. And it says in the Bible that there was a time in Hezekiah, King Hezekiah's life, it says God removed his spirit from Hezekiah. And why did God do that? It says God drew his spirit back to test Hezekiah to see what was in his heart. So sometimes you and I as followers of Jesus, we find things going uh, along and we feel like we're distant from God. Did you know sometimes that can be God just simply pulling back? Because he wants to test you to see where your heart is and where your faith is. Now, don't panic because Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that you will not be tested beyond what God will do in your life to provide for you and strengthen you. He will give you grace to come through every test you have in life. Every test. So life on this earth is a test. We ask ourselves, 
How are we living our lives? What's important to us? And look at this. I think it's on your outline. James 1.12 says, Blessed are those who endure when they are tested. Dear friends, are you in the midst of a test you never imagined before in your life? God hasn't lost sight of you. Blessed are those who endure when they are tested. When they pass the test. Everybody say, pass the test. They will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Life on earth is a test. Ask ourselves, what in the world am I living for? Who am I living for? Next, if we're going to live our lives because our lives will last forever, believe that you are affecting eternity. Your decisions and your actions today are making a difference down the road. Would you do me a favor? I didn't put it in there, and let's see if we can pull this off. But on the left side of your outline under believe, put a dot. Just put a dot there. And then from that dot, draw a line all the way across the page and put an arrowhead at the end of that line. Can you do that? Are we able to do that without me doing the audio visual thing? The audio visual thing. So put a dot on one side, the left side of the paper, and then draw a line all the way across. That dot represents our life on this earth. We are just, this life is just a drop in the bucket. And the line all the way across represents eternity. And you just keep going forever. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining, you get the idea? This life is just, just a short time. It's just a little bit of time compared to what's coming down the road. Believe that you are affecting eternity because you are. And why is that? Because God has given you gifts, abilities, He's given you means, he's given you friends, he's given you time in order for you to make a difference for eternity. So here's the second, it's a picture of what life is all about. Life is a test, and secondly, life on this earth is a trust. Life on earth is a trust. Life on earth is a trust. Now what's a trust? What does that mean? Write this down. See if you got it right. How many here have a, a, a car? Maybe it's a, a low rider. Uh, I'm not thinking of you, Jose. Anyway, um, uh, um, maybe it's a beautiful new car. How many have a new car? Oh, nobody's going to confess it here. If you've got one, come see me afterwards. I want to test drive it, and then I'll give it back. So I'll let you buy it. I'll just sample it. But let me ask you a question. What is there in your life that is not a gift from God? What do you have in your life that you would have if God wasn't providing it? You want, you want the answer? You want to know what the answer is? Nada. Nothing. Zip. Nothing. Not a thing. You wouldn't have anything if God didn't trust you. And by the way, God trusts you in amazing ways. He's given you a lot of trust. God is the owner, and you and I are the managers. And how we manage what God has given us in this day in our lives will reflect on how God works in our lives in the future. Does that make sense? How many say your life is not your own? That is true. Your life is not your own. God gave you life. He had you in mind, the Bible says, before the world was even created, he had you in mind. And he wanted to give you life, and he wanted to provide for you, and he, wanted, he gave you a set of skills and abilities and personality. Some of you got more personality than others. Some of you really, God, I think, overdid it on the personality side. Anyway, uh, but everything you have and I have is a gift from God. God is the owner. We are the managers. And so everybody say that. God is the owner. We are the managers. God is the owner. We are the managers. First Corinthians 4, 7 says, What do you have that God hasn't given you? Good question. So you, you tell me. What do you have that God hasn't given you? If you have a place of service, if you've got a position where you work, who gave you that? Who did? God. You're getting the idea. Everybody say, God did. God did. 
What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why do you boast as though you've accomplished something on your own? And it says those who are trusted with something valuable must show they are worthy of that trust. That's what God says to us. He gives you a trust in this life. Life on this earth is a trust. And it is a preparation for eternity. And one day, you will stand before Almighty God and with love, he wants to say to you, here's what Jesus told the story of and this is what you want God. Don't, we all want God. In fact, we want people saying this today. But here's what the story says. Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Now come and share your master's happiness. Now when you and I believe that we're affecting eternity and that the life we've been given and all that we have is a trust and we then treat it as though it is a trust, a gift from God, then God will come along one day. In fact, he's probably doing it now and say, you know, I'm proud of you. You're doing good. He will affirm you. Secondly, he's going to promote you in the future. Now, some of you go, "Uh, I've never been able to get the promotion, never gotten. But God says, if you're faithful today, he will promote you down the road. If you've been faithful in little things, he's going to give you more. He's going to give you more. Now, let me just tell you, some of you think heaven is about you being like a little cherub with diapers on, sitting on a cloud and strumming some kind of thing that looks stringy. That is not heaven. That may be more apt a description of hell, but that is not heaven. (laughs) Heaven is going to be the most incredible adventure. If this life has any taste, foretaste, the next life, off the charts. We won't be there two seconds before we go, what was I thinking? This is life. This is living. So you're going to be affirmed, you're going to be promoted, and you're going to be Invited to the celebration. Anybody ever known of a party and you didn't get invited? I mean, one you wanted to go to? Do you know that if you put your faith in action, taking what God's given you, you're going to be the guest of honor at an incredible celebration. And God is big enough that he can pull it off for every one of us. So, ask yourself, if I'm going to live my life, In light of the fact that I'll live forever, ask myself, what am I living for? That's a good question for you to ask today. Believe that your life today affects tomorrow, affects eternity. C, call on Jesus Christ. Call on Jesus. Call on Jesus. Everyone dies. How many believe that? Yeah. You know, there will be a day that you... Or me, whatever day it is, it's our day, and we will die. Unless Jesus comes back before then, and I love that idea. Come on, Jesus, that's great. But most of us in this room, we will die. We're going to die. Now, hey, pick me up. This is Sunday morning. What are you talking about? The fact of the matter is, apart from Christ, not only do we die physically, we die spiritually. Everyone dies because all of us are related to Adam, the first man. You know, when I get a chance to talk to Adam, I am going to clean his clock. (laughs) You know, if it wasn't Adam, it would have been Dennis. Are you following me? But all who are related to Christ, everybody say related. Related. Everybody who's related to Christ will be given new life. Friends, let me ask you a question. Are you related to Christ today? Are you related to Jesus today? So here's the deal. I call on Jesus Christ because not only is life a test, not only is life a trust, but life is a temporary assignment. It's all temporary. Everybody say temporary. 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 No matter how much you might polish that car and try and keep it in good shape, it's just temporary. No matter what, uh, how many know that you buy things and then they get old because they wear out and you got to go buy new things in order to feel good about the new thing you have, right? Because it's all temporary. We were born but yesterday and our days on earth are as transient as a shadow. 
What a picture that the Bible gives about our life. And David, his prayer was this, Lord, help me to realize how brief my time on earth will be. Help me to know that I'm here, but for a moment. Isn't that a great prayer? Great prayer. So, if I call on Jesus, if I recognize life as a temporary assignment, I live my life to please Jesus. I live my life to honor him. When we live, we live to please the Lord. And when we die, we go to be with the Lord. How many are looking forward to going to be with the Lord? How many just don't want it to be today? So, if we're going to live our lives and be good stewards, if we're going to be those who live in light of eternity, then we need to call on Jesus and last but not least, do regular eternal investing. I don't know if that works very good, but uh, I just made that up. Do regular eternal investing. Now, when I got home this week, I, I had gotten in the mail a piece of uh, mail, and I'm trying to find it, but it doesn't matter. So it's here somewhere. Oh, there it is. So I got this in the mail. I love these pieces. In fact, uh, I can't, ex but there's an organization um, in uh, Oregon, and they send letters to pastors all the time about investing our money so that we can have a great retirement. And I love, I was trying to find their piece of material because they'll write things like, uh, invest in your future and they then make loans to churches and things like that and, and build the kingdom of God at the same time. And I kind of like scratch my head and go, okay, let me see. This is kind of a mixed message here. So I want to save up for the future, and the side benefit is I get to strengthen the kingdom of God. Does that not sound backwards to you? Should it not be the kingdom first, and then we'll worry about the saving for us later? What? Is that right? That's right. So... Do regular eternal investing. So this was uh, from a um, company that provides retirement. Uh, take an important first step to the future. <laughs> Invest. We'll help you prepare for the future, and you get a free gift right now. <laughs> Find the balance between today's needs. Everybody say needs. needs. And your future plans. That is a perfect sentence, but it shouldn't be about investing in the stock market. Though there's nothing wrong with that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just going, real living is when I live in light of the future. And by the way, not only is my, are my needs met today, but way over the, over the top, I have a lot of my wants that are also taken care of. Do you have the same? How many here have a cell phone? Do you need that or do you want that? We need it because we are living in the good old USA. Right? We've turned a lot of things that we thought were just wants. Now they're needs. We've got to have them. In fact, I've met people that didn't have enough money necessarily to buy food, but they had a phone and they were paying on it monthly. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. i got a phone, too. And by the way, if you're texting right now, just tell everybody I said hello. <laughs> but if we're going to be preparing and living our life, live your life like you will live forever because you will. So I want to tell you the best investing you can do is for eternity's sake. Let heaven fill your thoughts. In fact, one person said, if heaven is your main concern, you will be the greatest help on earth. Some people say, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. But if you're truly heavenly minded, you will be the greatest influence upon the earth. Because you got your priorities right. So here it goes. I'll give it to you quick. My identity is in eternity. It's not temporary. My identity is in eternity. I'm going to live forever, and you're going to live forever. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are going to live forever. <laughs> and one day when you get that new body... You're going to look forever 21. <laughs> My identity is in eternity. My homeland is in heaven. Now, some of you may be here in this gathering. You're carrying a green card because you don't have United States citizenship yet. Could I suggest to you that we all should carry spiritual green cards? 
Put them in your wallet, put them in your purse, and when you pull it up, it reminds you, this is not home. We're just passing through. So my homeland is in heaven. How many kind of enjoy life? More or less, you, you're enjoying your life. And you're just passing through. Can you imagine how much you're going to enjoy heaven? Off the charts, you will not be disappointed. Thirdly, my citizenship is in the kingdom of God. So, I want to do regular eternal investing. The Bible says we are Christ's ambassadors. We are Christ's ambassadors. He's put us here that we could reflect his kingdom to those around us. And that we would live our lives in such a way that we invest in others and we invest for the kingdom of God so that uh, we are preparing ourselves not only for today but for the future. So how many have any ideas of what you can do to invest eternally? Let me give you one. I'll give you, I can give you several. In the next few weeks we're going to talk about this. How many here uh, thinks if it's to be, it's up to me? You kind of get this idea that if, it, if anything's going to happen, you got to take care of it. How many thought that? Yeah, Andy and I. Yeah. We spend way too much time thinking, how am I going to take care of all this? Because we think we are dependent on ourselves alone. It's called humanism. Ism. It's called we are the center of our world and we got to take care of ourselves. So let me just give you one way you can invest eternally. You can invest in eternity for God's glory and your sake. And that is to daily have some time quietly with God. A daily quiet time. Because everything around us in the culture says you don't have time for that. Am I right? You got to get on to the next thing. But if you want to have peace in the day and you want to be building for your future, then the one thing you can do if you're a follower of Jesus is to take some time out every day and uh, you must write it into your schedule or you will not get it in your schedule. Because the minute you wake up, how many have text messages on your phone? Boom. How many have uh, things that are happening? You got to get here. You got to do that. <sighs> okay. And oh, I'll talk to God this evening. <laughs> daily time. If you really believe that this life is just preparation for the next, one of the things you can do is to hit the pause button and listen for God's voice and express your love for him and your dependence upon him. That's regularly investing for eternity. First, uh, isn't that simple? Now, how many here believe that you should have some time with God, appointment time with God every day? There's about a dozen of us. It's good. That's good. If you want to have growing peace in your life today, and you want to be growing and preparing for tomorrow, and you want to give glory to God, then one thing you can do is just set aside some time for God every day. When you have a love for somebody, when you're in a relationship with somebody, the most important way you show that love for them is called T-I-M-E, time. You give them your attention. Friends... This world is not your home. Why don't we say that out loud together? Friends, this world is not your home. Now take your preacher finger and turn it on the person next to you and say, Friend, this world is not your home. we got to bring it to a conclusion. Friend, this world is not your home, so don't make yourself so cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourself cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. 1 Corinthians 7.31 says, Those that are in frequent contact with the things of the world should make good use of them without becoming attached to them. For this world and all it contains will pass away. Aren't those good verses? A couple of weeks ago, oh, I shouldn't tell you this story. I'll tell it next week. Deanna's cousin sells cars. 
and he gets in trade-ins, used cars come back. Man, they are nice cars. A couple weeks ago, I went, and I was in San Jose, so I drove by to visit John Scott, and man, I had this beautiful used car right there. So I said, hey, can I take that for a test drive? Sure. I need this car. You know, Lord, that I'm just driving this little dinky car my daughter left behind when she left college. I mean, it was her car. You know, she's supposed to have the dinky car. I'm supposed to have the nice car. But she left me the dinky car. She took my car to New York. And by the way, don't tell her I said this, and it's going out over the World Wide Web. I'm in trouble. <laughs> but it's amazing what I discover that I need when I see it. <laughs> Oh, wow, I didn't know I needed that. Oh, 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 man, I need it now. <laughs> By the way, don't take me to Costco, because everything I see, I need. <laughs> Does that happen to you? All right. Those in frequent contact with the thing... By the way, I didn't get the car. I'm still driving Devonie's dinky car, but it gets great gas mileage. So, it's a little putt-putt. Anyway... <clears throat> Those in frequent contact with the things of the world should make good use of them without becoming attached to them. How many have become attached to too many things? For this world and all it contains, even nice new cars, will pass away. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. Everybody say temporary. temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. So, let me just wrap it up with this. Life is a test. Life is a trust. Life is a temporary assignment. This is not home. Will you, as much as you know how, live your life because you were made for eternity? You were made to last forever. You will live your life in light of living forever. Is that you? Will you live like you were made to last forever? Will you? Because, to everybody in the room, you are made to last forever. You are. Real living, life that is full and satisfying, has nothing to do with the values of this world. The haves and the have-nots. In God's eyes, the greatest heroes are not those who have the goods that look and good or that are feeling good. The real heroes are those who treat life as though it is a test and a trust and a temporary assignment, serving faithfully and looking forward to their promised rewards in eternity. I think there's one verse on the bottom of your outline that says this. All these great people died in faith. Talking about the heroes of years gone by. They did not get the things that God promised his people, but they saw them coming far in the future and were glad. And they said... They were like visitors and strangers on the earth. They were like visitors and strangers on the earth. They were looking forward to a better home in heaven. That's why God wasn't ashamed for them to call him their God. He even built a city for them. The story is told, and I finish with this. We're just beginning this series on... Uh, being good managers. God is the owner. We're the managers. This life isn't all there is. The story is told that years ago, there was a missionary returning from overseas on a ship that came into port, and it so happened that the President of the United States was on that ship when they came into port years ago, and bands were there, and people were there, and there was great honor. They were welcoming the President home. And the missionary who had been out on the mission field and uh, quietly slipped off the boat and kind of had a little pity party saying, you know, I've been out there serving and doing all this, and yet uh, nobody's welcoming me home. They're recognizing him, but nobody's noticing me. How many have ever had a pity party like that? And he said, the story goes, in the missionary, the Lord prompted him and said, listen. You're not home yet. You're not home yet. You see, when we die, we're not leaving home. 
we're going home. And it'll be off the charts, no doubt about it. So here's my simple question. Will you today, as much as you know how, say, I will live my life as though I'm going to last forever because I am. And if that's your desire, if that's your heart, say, I'm in. I want it. I'm in. Whose life is it anyway? So if that's you, I want to invite you to just stand with me this morning. Ryan, come pray over us. Bless us. In weeks to come, I'm going to try and get you some copies of I Like Giving. And uh, check out ilikegiving.com. And then hopefully, don't go away in the weeks to come because... Uh, I got this book this last week because I've been reading up on it, and it's entitled How to Be Rich. How many would like to be rich? Okay, so come back in the weeks to come, right? Thank you, Pastor. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the stirrings that you put in our hearts, Father. We thank you for the ideas that you've planted, the seeds you've given into our minds, that they take root, Father, that you bless us, Lord that you continue to provide for our needs, Lord, that you give us wisdom beyond what we thought was possible, that you protect our families, protect us in our workplaces, our schools, protect us in our traveling. And Lord, use us to impact this community. Use us to be the light upon the hill. Use us to grow your kingdom. We thank you and we praise you and we love you, Father. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Thanks for joining with us today in our streaming of our service and our message. We're grateful that you joined with us. And if we can serve in any way, we'd be glad to do that. Just check out our website. That'll get you connected in any way that you might like to. And uh, that is greenvalleychurch.net. And we wish you the best and know that you really do matter to God. Have a great day.